also have the privilege to reintroduce our next speaker, Dr. Anna Kelly. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Interstitial Cystitis Association and all the wonderful people uh, who helped organize this event. I love it when things start and end on time. And so I am honored to be here today with so many wonderful speakers. Almost every time a speaker has uh, made a point, I've thought to myself, yes, I, I want to make that point too. But I promise not to copy all five or six speakers that have been here. Uh, already and, and bring you something new today. Um, I'm a bit of a defector. I was trained in Western medicine and uh, employed by uh, various anesthesia groups delivering anesthesia to surgical patients. I also worked in, chronic, in the chronic pain patient uh, population in the hospital clinic and then later in private clinics doing blocks. And um, I no longer do that. I became very dissatisfied with the, be, being merely a technician. So I defected from Western medicine and now practice something called integral medicine. I've had a, lit, a little bit more difficulty than usual in preparing for this talk, not because of the slides, those were done weeks ago, but because I'm going to be talking about something that's more, um, more nebulous, if you will, than scientific materialism. I'm going to be talking about something that's less well studied and documented, something that's less well measured and something that's less material than surgical or other interventions like medications. This is integral medicine where aspects of health that go beyond the numbers, beyond the microscopic findings, are just as important. So health is seen as an integration of all aspects of what it means to be human. So this makes me ask the question, well, what does it mean to be human? So we simply can't leave one aspect of our lives out. The truth is, I don't know what it's like to suffer from chronic daily pain. I don't know what it's like to have frequent or urgent urination. But I do, as I suspect most humans do, suffer from other things. And I work with chronic pain patients on a daily basis in my practice. So it's with a spirit of great humility that I stand before you today and talk about my passion, acupuncture, in the integral medicine setting, and what I've learned from working with chronic pain patients over the years. Many of these patients have found the Western medical system to be inadequate in the treatment of the complex disease of chronic pain, pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, Many patients have found Western medicine to be inadequate in treating the complex, the beautiful, and the ever mysterious thing called a human. So I want to talk with you a little bit about the why I'm a defector. Uh, Descartes was a Western mathematician and philosopher uh, in the 17th century who described the body as a machine composed of parts, much like your automobile. Um, so you can see on this model that the lungs are bellows, the uh, kidneys are a filter, the bladder is a, a little holding tank there, and the joints are cogs and wheels. Eastern medicine views the body as a garden, a theater almost, as uh, Barry Jarnigan talked about the pelvic theater. I'm here to talk with you about the human theater. Um, and it says, how are these parts related one to the other? So you can see if there's excess cloud cover outside, that's going to mean perhaps that there's more dampness in the basement. If the, if the weather's rainy, you're going to have dampness in the basement. I'd also like to make a very important distinction between integrative and integral medicine. Um, integrative medicine is becoming an increasingly popular term, and we've talked so much this morning about the multidisciplinary approach. But let's bear in mind what we mean when we say integral. It doesn't just mean choosing 
two from column A and three from column B and two different therapies from column C and finding out what works for you. That's integrative medicine. Integral medicine expects that all lines of development will come along so that there's not only a, a wholeness of the body, but there's a wholeness in relationships of practitioner to patient, of husband to wife, of mother to child, brother to sister, employer to employee. So one of the overarching themes in my practice is what's your relationship to all of these things like? And so acupuncture is a very useful tool for practicing integral medicine because it is a science of relationships. Acupuncture is also a science of integrity. If we look at Western medicine and we say, what's the integrity of the structural system? What's going on in the bladder wall, for example? Eastern medicine says, what's the integrity of the functional and energetic systems of the body? Um, and so integral medicine gives me a chance to peer into and to, 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 to discuss things that uh, we don't often talk about in a traditional medical clinic. Integral medicine considers, of course, the patient's health history, their current symptoms, their medications, uh, what their work is like, what are their activities of daily living. One of my favorite questions is, what do you enjoy about your work? And what's the most challenging thing about your work? I had one patient, I said, what do you like most about your work? And she said, the people. And we talked a bit about that. And then I said, what do you find most challenging at your work? And she said, the people. <laughs> <laughs> Integral medicine also looks at the constitutional type. Uh, acupuncture is a beautiful way to consider the different constitutional types that we are. Um, it, it makes a distinction between the fiery, talkative, woman who moves about a lot, crosses her legs and uncrosses her legs a lot, and the quiet, contemplative uh, comrade that she has. Um, it also looks at our cultural conditioning. In the South, there's a construct that whenever you ask a woman how she's doing, she almost always says, fine. And this can create a division within. When, when we look good and we're coordinated and we've matched our shoes to our purse, and we've put on a good face and we're out in the world. Uh, how many of you have experienced uh, a disconnect when your bladder is calling attention to itself? You've had to stop 20 times on your trip, on your two or three hour trip to the mountains, and you get there and someone says, how are you doing? You look great, you know, and you feel terrible. This can create a disconnect and a discord, and a lot of the chronic pain patients that I've worked with over the years have seen the fallacy in thinking, well, I'll just compartmentalize the painful part of my body off if they have a painful limb. I just won't think about my, my leg, for example, or if it's the bladder. I just won't think about my bladder. And this, as you know, doesn't work. So one of the things integral medicine does is it helps us reintegrate all body parts and all aspects of what it means to be human together. It also looks at the cultivation of virtue, it asks a lot from the patient. It asks that you actually develop and change over time so that if you know you have a trigger food that will consistently make your bladder pain worse, that you would properly exert your will and not uh, uh, use that food if you've decided that you're not going to do that. So I have a lot of patients that say, I'm going to do a gluten-free diet. They meet with a the nutritionist, they commit to it, and then usually sometime later, you know, there's a relapse. And so we talk about that in Chinese medicine, and there's a lot of points that we use in acupuncture that help patients properly exert, exert their will in a world of endless choice. So integral medicine is beyond any technique or style. I'm actually going to be talking about acupuncture, but I understand the physicians uh, and speakers that are going to be talking after me are going to... Uh, speak about other complementary and alternative medicine techniques. Integral medicine considers something called AQUAL, and I'd like to talk with you about that. Uh, not that any particular practitioner you might see knows about the AQUAL theory, but I think it will help you understand which practitioners are developmentally inclined and are going to be looking at all aspects of what it means to be humans and which are mere technicians of body parts. By the way, I'm a big fan of Western medicine. I use it regularly, as do, as, as do my family members. 
Um, and the good thing that came out of this Cartesian model of man is, is we have these wonderful medicines, for example, that we talked about earlier today. We have the ability to transplant an organ should you need an organ transplant. So it's not that one model is wrong and the other right. Of course not. That's over, overly simplistic. It's just that one without the other I consider incomplete. And so I operate and interface a lot with practitioners of both styles of, of medicine, Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Um, integral medicine has development as its goal. So over time, there's more wholeness, less division. Um, I think another reason I've used I've uh, a little. I found it a bit challenging. Is number one, I'm talking with patients. Now I talk with patients every day in the clinic. Why would this be challenging? Well, I'm talking to an audience. I'm presenting my life work and telling you what I do. And I'm going to be making generalities, and that does not apply in every case. So we're going to be talking about, for example, a specific herb in just a moment, and it may or may not apply to an individual. So that's the whole point of seeing a practitioner who can individualize her treatments. Uh, she can appreciate that each and, each and every one of us bring something different into the treatment room. Now let's look at AQUAL, all quadrants, all levels. Please don't worry if you can't read what's in each of these quadrants, but you can see there's four quadrants on the slide. There's a right upper quadrant, and this is where Western medicine lives, so to speak. Um, it's about measure, it's, it's about objectively measuring what's out there. So it says, let's look at a thousand patients that have interstitial cystitis and let's measure um, certain proteins in their urine. It's an objective measurement of the physical world. The left upper quadrant is something that I think gets lost often in Western medicine. It says, what is your subjective experience? And so what is this intersubjective relationship between us when there's a collective and mutual striving towards that which is higher, that which is more whole. And in the face of more diversity, can there be more integration and more wholeness and more unity? Um, and this spans not just uh, medical, uh, the medical considerations that we're here to discuss this weekend, but we're living in a more global community than ever. And so integral medicine considers what it means to be a human from a very, very large, even cosmologic perspective. We are sitting here, the end product, and hopefully there'll be more coming after us, but the end product of 14 billion years of cosmic unfolding. And uh, that puts me in a position of, uh, of great humility. I, I think my life's but a blink in, in, um, in relationship to that 14 billion year unfolding so I do often ask myself, why are we here <laughs> as humans? You know, this is an important existential question that matters. The left lower quadrant is very important as we consider the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. How do we take care of ourselves as a society? So what are the rules and laws and reimbursement issues that come up around um, health care? I broke free not only from Western medicine, but also from the very increasingly broken and perhaps corrupt third party payer system. Um, and, and yet I'm struck that I use that third party payer system when one of my family members is hospitalized. So uh, what are the rules and laws regarding that? What is our collective uh, decision on that when we decide to live together as a nation? And so. That's the left lower quadrant. So all this stuff comes up in the treatment room. Um, and I love what I do. So if we summarize, the left-hand side of the quadrants are the subjective experience that we all know about. And it's what good poetry and good literature and music is about. It's why we seek the spiritual in our lives. The right-hand side of the quadrants are what's our objective experience. How many of you in here have a blue shirt on? How many of you here have proteins, certain proteins in your urine? Um, so most experts agree an integral approach is best. I like this definition. Integral means, among other things, that the entire scope of treatment of, of any given individual occurs in a very large context. So it literally embraces and looks at 
life, your, your specific life conditions, your relationship with others, your constitutional type, your level of cultural development. Do you see yourself in the context of the whole world or are you identified with your, with your clan or tribe? You know, in the South, we kind of stick together, you know. We don't really spread out to, to, to other parts of the world. So there's a, you know, a very specific thing that's called Southern cultural conditioning, you know. Um, it ultimately considers the patient's degree of integrity. Integrity is defined as a narrow gap between the highest that's been revealed to us and how we're actually living. So if I say I want to do an anti-inflammatory diet and I make that commitment and I declare to my family that I'm going to do that and I can't follow through with it, that's a lack of integrity on my part. And, and we're all divided. Um, I'm a big coffee drinker, and it's revealed to me that that's not a good thing for me to do. I'm having, uh, you know, some issues with it, and so I've got to cut that out. Um, it, so I can, I can relate to, uh, to that issue, and it's, I think, the paramount thing when we're seeing a practitioner, that we, we simply can't remain victims of our circumstance. So integral medicine asks a lot of the patient. It asks the patients to take responsibility for the choices that they're making. And that's hard for us to do because we live in a culture of endless choice. And of course, integral medicine considers the symptoms. So let's talk about acupuncture because I found it a medicine so beautifully suited um, in the practice of in integral medicine. Acupuncture, simply put, is the insertion of solid, very thin needles into strategic points on the body to ensure the smooth flow of qi. The model for pain in Chinese medicine is that pain is the blockage of qi. It's the stagnation of qi in the body, somewhere in the body, either in an organ or in a meridian. And so we place needles in the body, and we'll talk about why the needle is so perfectly suited to its function. Uh, it actually moves electrons through the saltwater medium of the body. Uh, we'll take a look at that in a, sec in a, in a minute. But there's also a, another aspect to acupuncture. This is sort of a right upper quadrant explanation of what acupuncture is and what happens to endorphins when you, when you place an acupuncture needle in the body. Uh, endorphins typically go up and other neurotransmitters are regulated. But also what happens in the treatment room itself. So it very much considers your subjective experience. Most patients describe it as relaxing and they actually look forward to their visits. Let's talk a little bit about some of the terminology just because it sounds so foreign to us, but it's actually beautiful and poetic. Let's talk about qi and then yin and yang, the organs and meridians. Qi is uh, present in all life. So qi points to the fact that we are energetic beings, but we are in a material form. So I love it, it sort of correlates with Einstein's brilliant discovery that E equals MC squared, energy equals matter, multiplied by a coefficient. We can, look at, we can look at levels of chi. Contrast the 18-year-old teenager that's broken a limb, that's hollering in the ER and raising a stink and requiring a lot of attention. Compare that to that frail 85-year-old grandmother who's curled up in the stretcher in the hall of the ER not making a peep. They're both hurting. They both require attention. One has so much chi, it's coming out in a great force, and the other's withdrawn and curled up in a ball. One is a very young presentation of pain, hollering and screaming and kicking and uh, demanding attention, and, and another is a very yin presentation, curled up in a ball, being very quiet, probably cold, needs a blanket. So yang and yin are complementary terms. Uh, we can experience what it's like to be in hot water unless we've ever been in cold water. So they're relative terms. They also transform one into the other. So just as night transforms into day, that's a metaphor for, I mean, that's a, we, we can look to yin transforming into yang and see that the two correlate. So uh, for example, when it's dark outside is, is really when we should be sleeping. So I work with a lot of night workers, ER nurses and physicians and other night workers. And there's a very specific uh, thing that we do to reset the, the yin yang clock, so to speak. We're meant to be awake, engaged, alert, and interested during the day, that's the young time of day, and sleeping and restored and restful at night.
So here's a list of yang things, and here's a list of yin things. The, ar the archetype for uh, the yin thing is the nursing mother. The nursing mother holds the baby close to her chest. There's milk being transferred from the breast to the baby. Uh, there's the female tenderness, quiet touch. The archetype for yang activities is the male plowing the fields. His, the yang surface of the body, which is the back, is to the sun. Um, he's digging and sweating in the sun, um, and he's actually doing a lot of hard work. So that's some differences between yang and yin. So in Chinese medicine, I'm always asking, is this a yin phenomenon or a yang phenomenon? And we'll talk about how that applies to IC in just a second. The organs are all related to each other. You can see that the yang organs are mostly hollow organs, and their paired yin organs are mostly solid. So bladder goes with kidney, small intestine with heart, and so forth. There's also an interesting relationship between the bladder and the small intestine. And so patients do, in fact, some patients do, in fact, do very well with an anti-inflammatory diet or a gluten-free diet because there's a relationship between heat or inflammation in the small intestine and uh, interstitial cystitis pain, bladder pain. This heat gets transferred through paired organs to the bladder. So often we'll spend quite a bit of energy healing the gut in a patient with IC or pelvic pain, and this can make a big difference in the quality of their life. So the needle uh, actually acts like a little micro battery, and this is a right upper quadrant uh, explanation in our AQUAL theory, but it's a beautiful explanation because we're actually doing something with the needle. We're moving stuck energy, if you will, from one place in the body to the other. Whenever you place a needle in the skin, it's warmer, of course, on the inside of the body than it is on the outside of the body. And whenever there's a temperature differential across a metal, there's a small but measurable electrical potential. So uh, this is potentiated through two things with the needle. One is a bimetallic configuration. Most acupuncture needles are comprised of metal at the shaft, and then there's a coiled metal that's often a second metal that cools that part of the needle and potentiates this temperature gradient, which then uh, potentiates the electrical gradient activity of the needle. So we're actually directing electrons through the body. Now, I don't actually practice something called traditional Chinese medicine, but it's a useful way to talk about how IC is, is seen from the TCM point of view. TCM is comprised of acupuncture and related techniques such as cupping. Uh, we also use herbs in our clinic. And uh, I, can make, I can make Chinese medicine pretty simple for you. If something's cool, you warm it up. If something's too hot, you cool it down. If something's deficient, and a lot of my patients are deficient, they're so exhausted by their pain, um, they get winded walking up a flight of steps, we're gonna try to add more energy to that patient. We may use an herb called mugwort or artemisia vulgaris in a technique called moxibustion. Now, the literature review is, is scarce. Um, we're not gonna find a lot of studies in peer-reviewed literature. We're certainly not gonna find a lot of studies in the Western medical literature. But there's been a few that demonstrate that this thing called electroacupuncture is very useful for intractable interstitial cystitis. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, there's certain types of electrical acupuncture that disperse excess, and there's certain types of electrical acupuncture that strengthen or tonify deficiency. So anyone who's practicing electroacupuncture on a regular basis will know and be able to speak to this. And there's currently more than one NIH study underway to evaluate the efficacy of acupuncture in IC patients. And here's some useful websites if you want to look into that. But I was very interested that the NIH takes an interest in, in uh, establishing the uh, efficacy of different complementary and alternative treatments, and a, a big area of study is, in fact, acupuncture. So they're looking at acupuncture for hundreds of conditions, including those I've listed here, migraines, insomnia, hypertension, breech presentation, irritable bowel syndrome, and a hundred others. So we'll know more as time goes on, but what I find useful is my own direct clinical experience. I've, let me just give you some statistics on IC. Uh, so out of the 100% of patients that I see that have IC and related pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic pain, 
5% or so are going to have miracle cures. You'll read about these people on our website. They'll have two or three visits and their symptoms are completely resolved. We've all had that. I don't know if it's a miracle or if it's a fluke, uh, but I think most practitioners in medicine have had uh, patients that have done supremely well with a particular therapy. And I've learned to not take credit for that because then I'd have to blame myself for the 20 or 25 percent that don't respond at all to acupuncture. Um, so about 20 or 25 percent of patients with pelvic floor issues, interstitial cystitis, and bladder, bladder pain won't respond to, to what I do in the clinic. Some of them keep coming back to see me because even though that doesn't make their bladder pain worse, it helps with their hypertension and their insomnia and their anxiety. But I found this um, that certain patients just are not responsive to it. And most people are somewhere in the middle. In our clinic, we do individualized treatment. We don't copy studies. The problem with doing randomized placebo-controlled trials is some NIH practitioner will tell me do once a week treatment on these 100 interstitial cystitis patients and use these points. Well, this takes away my uh, ability to see that the patients aren't the same from week to week. Uh, and if you're in a study and it's telling me I have to do these eight points and I can see that some of those points are actually going to make the heat worse, I don't like that. Um, so we actually need to have some useful conversation, maybe even some roundtable conversation to, uh, on what does constitute efficacy studies in these fields of alternative and complementary medicine, but particularly acupuncture. One particular herb we do use, I just bring this up as an example, is, is an herb called gentiana drain fire. It's comprised of 12 separate herbs in, in what we call a patent, so it's in a pill form. Uh, it drains fire or heat from the liver and gallbladder and drains damp heat from the lower burner, which is where the bladder resides. So this would be for a patient that has heat symptoms, red face, burning eyes, irritability. They may raise their voice and shout a lot. A lot of my colleagues in Western medicine are very disappointed that I'm a defector. They, they say, I, I can't believe you. You were a well-respected anesthesiologist, and we love sending you our pain management patients to do the blocks. And, Plus, you're doing something that's woo-woo-y and unproven. You know, they don't like it. Um, it's interesting, though, because over the 15 years that I've been doing it, a lot of them I've seen in my clinic. Um, I've seen their, their wives, their children, their, their, uh, their parents. Um, so the definition of, I like of, of humility is being interested in what we don't know. So. Please invite physicians into your life that are interested in what they don't know and will look into uh, these complementary and alternative therapies. Um, physicians who have studied either integrative or integral medicine can be helpful resources. So, for example, Andrew Weil has a, an integrative medicine program. Tufts University, Duke University, Stanford, they all have multidisciplinary integrative programs. And so these can be useful resources. But the truth is, most of us are getting care in private clinics, aren't we? Um, but you can use these uh, places as resources. Uh, one way to find a uh, medical acupuncturist is to go to the website medicalacupuncture.org. And uh, one way to find a licensed acupuncturist is to go to uh, nccaom.org.